Hey guys, welcome to Chess Boot Camp. You're in the right place if you want to learn to play better chess. If you're a beginner, you want to improve, you want to get beyond the 1000 point rating barrier. So in today's video, I've got three games, three rapid format games that I've played all against players between the 800 and the 900 rating range. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at these games and we're specifically going to look for the mistakes that beginners make. Okay, so we've got the first one up on the board. We're going to go up in, uh, in rating. So this player's rated 818 and um, I started with the white pieces. So to mix things up, I played D4 and then E6 is played. And so I'm going to play the London system. Makes a lot of sense. And now d5 so we've got a kind of symmetrical situation on the board with the exception that because uh, black played e6 on their first move this light square bishop is now going to struggle to get out into the board develops his knight i develop my knight this is all standard london system um, setup so far Normally this knight would come to here, this bishop would come to here, and this pawn will come to c3. And that's what's significant about black's move here. Um, we're looking at beginner's mistakes, and this is technically a pin on the knight. The knight can't move because it's pinned to the king, but it allows me to play my next move for free. c3. I was going to play c3 anyway. It gives me a nice chain of pawns up that side completes my pawn pyramid and it's what all it's going to do is force black to make and use another turn to retreat his bishop which he does to a5 now i develop my light square bishop to its natural square on d3 and black develop it develops his final knight i develop my final knight and <clears throat> can you see the mistake with this move so I guess what Black's thinking is something about Fianchetto in this bishop or bringing it out to a6. However, he's got a bishop on the side of the board and bishops on the side of the board can be sometimes vulnerable to getting trapped by pawns. Right now, um, a, a more experienced player, I think, would probably here consider this move and then think, is there anything stupid about this move? You know, what can my opponent do next? But particularly, you are more aware that all your pieces need to be able to get to safety if they have to. And that would lead me to think, oh, hang on, if b4 is played, my bishop's trapped. And uh, lo and behold, I play b4. The bishop's got literally nowhere to go. So we end up exchanging. Now he's got two pawns for his bishop. So it's not the end of the world. But it gets worse from this point on. Because uh, I white now has a fork. And it's indefensible, unfortunately. Uh, so I play queen to a4. So I'm hitting the king and I'm hitting the knight on b4. And this really just all come down to, I mean, I didn't do anything to create this situation. My opponent created this situation. And he created this situation by playing weird moves. But particularly this move, b6, which he played in, let's see. So this is a 15 plus 10 game. b6, he thought for 13 seconds about that move. Okay, he should have thought for a little bit longer. Okay, so now I'm hitting the king and the knight. Bishop interposes, I grab the knight. And this is simply a blunder, this one. And how long did he take over that one? He took another 14 seconds over that. So the thing is here, you've got two attackers and one defender. Well, no defenders, actually. He's, he's simply blundered the piece. I don't even need my bishop. I could have just grabbed it straight away with the queen. So I grab with the bishop, because um, what that does is it means that we're covering now two diagonals. My queen's still on this dark diagonal here, and my bishop's on there. So uh, the king has nowhere to go, which means that black must put a piece in the way. The pawn is no good, because bishop just takes, and we've got a fork on the king and the rook. Um, the queen can't interpose, so it's, I think it's going to have to be the knight. 
But no, he just decides to put the queen in the way. So I simply grab the queen. He had a knight, he could have used it. All right. So this is, this is the thing. Scanning the board, thinking about all your potential moves. The guy's used literally 11 seconds of his 15 minutes because of the increment. So you've got much longer time. And it's very, very common that when you make one mistake, beginners in particular will start to play too fast, um, start to be more careless, which is the exact opposite of what you need to do. Right? You make a mistake, you go down in material, it's time to go, okay, now let's check out the board. Some stuff has changed. Are there any new opportunities? Let's slow down, take our time, and uh, try and rebuild. Okay, Beginners tend to uh, compound mistakes on top of mistakes. So king takes the bishop. Now I'm, I'm way ahead in material, but I also have this nice <clears throat> dark square bishop here. I've got a semi-open file for my rook, and my knight's going to come in. So this standard opening position, um, putting my pieces in the right place, getting my pieces out onto the board to start with, and um, just playing sensible, rational, principled openings has uh, really just handed me this game on a plate. So knight comes in with check. This is kind of a fork. Um, the king can defend that pawn on f7 by moving back, but he doesn't. So I go in, grab the pawn, attack the rook. Force, uh, the rook doesn't move, the king moves back. So now I, I just bring in more of my pieces. All right, I've, got, I've now got one, two, three, four um, of my pieces around black's king, and normally three is the minimum, normally, the minimum required to effect a checkmate. So now the rook moves, but it's all a bit too late because uh, I come in with my rook that is defended there by the bishop. Uh, the king only has one square and then queen to e7 is a nice neat checkmate. So a few basic mistakes there. If we, if we go back, this is all okay. Um, this was an unnecessary move that forces his bishop to the side of the board and then after I develop, he develops, I develop and then a, a blunder. Right? And the thing you have to remember is he didn't make any terrible moves up until this point. Okay, But it's, it's the small differences in chess that magnify throughout the game. So if you do something like this and blunder a minor piece early on in the game then you can see how quickly the whole game can collapse around you. Okay, so that's the that's the lesson to take from this one. Let's move on to game two. In this game, I am playing with the black pieces. And my opponent starts with the unusual C4 English opening. You don't see it very often. So I play E5, King's Pawn. And I'm thinking now, I could actually be in my comfort zone here because what we've got on the board is actually the reverse of a Sicilian defense. And when I play the Sicilian de against the Sicilian defense, I'm not a Sicilian player myself, I play the Grand Prix attack with knight there, pawn out to f4 if I'm white, and then knight behind my pawn. So I figure, hey, happy days, I can play something I'm familiar with but in reverse. So knight comes out, f5 is played, and now I bring my knight out, so I'm, I'm quite comfortable here. Now he's preparing to fianchetto his bishop on uh, g2. I come out, pin the knight. This is not an, a, a pointless exercise. It means the knight can't move. It, it, it legally cannot move in the game. Um, and it forces white to do something. Now maybe he didn't want to keep his bishop there. Maybe he had ideas of bringing his bishop out to here, right? Or to here, you know, you, you never know. So tiny things, tiny advantages you can get over your opponent um, all make sense and, and can compound as the game goes on. So now I play d6, building my pawn structure, defending this pawn again on e5, Fianchetto is his bishop, and I castle. And then normally, then in the Grand Prix, the idea is to move your queen across to e1 or e8 in this case, and then to here or very often h5. 
white castles, I move my queen across. You can see I'm entirely in my comfort zone at this point. This is a 15 minute game. Now he attacks my bishop, I move back to uh, c5. And there is a you know slight threat of, you know, if he'd played, for example, b4, and then I move back, and then c5, that would have trapped my bishop. So I need to be aware of that. And he plays b4, but it, instead of moving back, I, I realize that I can simply move the bishop forwards, where it, it can be taken by a knight. Knight takes, and now knight takes. So it's always good. This knight is not involved in the defense of my king. That's this knight's job, right? So this guy here, being on c6, is not gonna play an attacking role in this game. He's not, he's not gonna be terribly active. It's kind of a passive place for him to be. So it's much better in this instance for me to recapture with a knight and to put my knight on there where it's, you can see, if it moves to either of these two squares, it could actually put the king in check. That might turn out to be useful, right? Much better than capturing with a pawn, where yes, I mean, I'll, I'll force this knight to move, but I'm, I've doubled up my pawns and not necessarily uh, improved my situation. So it's always a case of think, okay, how many options do I have? How many good options do I have? And out of those good options, which one leaves my position strongest relative to my opponent and I figure it's the knight so bishop comes out to harass the knight I'm not too concerned about that so I push my pawn forward I want to break open this situation around his king um, my, my light square bishop hasn't yet moved but has definitely has uh, ideas and opportunities got a lovely open diagonal there so uh, and I would say this is White's mistake. This is the turning point in this game. Up to this point, White's played okay. Um, material is equal, right? We've, we've exchanged a minor piece, that's it. He could have retreated his bishop, for example. And then if I captured on here, he could have recaptured with the f-pawn, opening up the entire f-file, where we've both got a rook. That's not a bad situation to be in. He's still got his bishop here, controlling the the light coloured squares, but to initiate the exchange um, when it's not favourable, beginner's mistake. Right? So he initiates the exchange and what he's done now is he's opened up this entire file in front of his king. If that bishop is ever forced to move, it's curtains. Could be. So now I spot this. Right? Can you see the pattern? Very, very simple classic checkmating pattern. So my intention is to move this final piece to h3 and maybe an unstoppable checkmate. So I'm completely unconcerned. He can take my knight, he can take my pawn, he can take my knight if he wants to. I know I've got checkmate in two unless he does something about it and quite honestly I can't see what he can do. So he grabs material, right? So he's prioritized grabbing material over king safety. Um, I mean, it's, it, it, he's got his work cut out here anyway because I, I really, I, I, I don't think he could actually stop checkmate at this point because of that pawn capture. So he's just captured with his pawn twice and basically lost the game. Bishop comes out to h3. There's absolutely nothing he can do. He just grabs another, was that a pawn? Grabs a knight for the sake of it. And queen goes in g2 checkmate, right? Did I do anything spectacular? I, I wasn't Kasparov on that game. I wasn't a master level player on that game. I played a solid opening, I played what I knew, I played patterns that I knew, and the reason why we have these openings, the reason why we have these patterns is because they have been shown to be robust over time. And you can see, again, one mistake, one little mistake. It's not that an 800 to 900 player is, you know, a third as good at chess as, as a 1400 player or half as good at chess, they're not. Chess is about small margins. Once you know the rules, everything's there on the board. You can, you can see it, right? And this is one of the main things. If I initiate this exchange, it's, it's, it's simply if then, if then, all the time. If I capture that pawn with my pawn, how does that leave my situation? Well, it exposes my king. I'm not very happy about that, okay? Um, if that pawn had still been here, for example, 
then this this checkmate maneuver wasn't possible right alternatively if my opponent captures my pawn with his pawn and then i recapture what are my options that's not too bad actually i can live with that so instead of using that move to initiate the exchange white should have used that move to do something else to improve his situation rather than make it worse there you go so that's game number two let's move on to game number three Okay, in this uh, game, this is actually a 30 minute rapid game and my opponent's rated 8, 9, 5. And I've got the white pieces, I start with e4, e5. So I'm thinking, I'm playing somebody less experienced, let's play a very classical line. So knight to f3, knight to c6, and then bishop to c4, the Italian game. Very, very classic way to start the game. And he plays a kind of symmetrical one here. Um, yeah, and because the knight is out here, I don't have the option of a track slow, but I wouldn't have done that anyway to a, a beginner. So, uh, principal play, d3, right? What is this doing? It's multi-purpose. It's moving into a secure position where it's protected by c2 and it's in turn protecting uh, e4. And it's opening up a diagonal for my dark square bishop. And all good. Uh, my opponent develops his knight to f6. I pin the knight, right? There is a purpose to this move, like we saw previously. Now this knight cannot move. If the knight moves, his queen is lost. So this is reducing his options in the game. Maybe his knight was on its way to here, protected by the bishop, with ideas of either the knight or, or the bishop capturing on, on f2. It's a very, very classic, normal pattern. So I prevent that idea and just get a little bit of upper hand by pinning the knight. And of course, I'm developing a piece at the same time, so what's not to like? Uh, black plays d6, mirroring my move. And we've almost got an entirely symmetrical uh, situation on the board. So now if I develop my knight and he brings his bishop out, we're completely symmetrical. So I bring my knight out. And now he plays a6. So what? Clearly what he's trying to do is removing the b5 square from my knight, and that's a good idea. I like it, right? Um, however, my knight probably wasn't going to head there because this isn't an option, right? c7 is not really a target at this point. I don't have a bishop against that, that square. So I, honestly, I wasn't thinking at all about this. What it, I can, however, do at this point would be to play knight to d5, because the only piece that could attack it is, is this knight on f6, and it's actually pinned. So I do. I actually do that move, and now black castles. So right now, all the materials on the board, both uh, sides have a solid looking position. Okay, so what we're looking for is a one mistake that turns the game. <clears throat> so now I capture the knight. Now, you see he's allowed me to do that, and I think it was really this kind of quiet move here preventing something that wasn't really on the cards. I mean, what, where's my knight going to go from there? It's not going to attack at uh, c, c7. So in doing this move, he has allowed me to play this move. Okay? You can, you can see very, very subtle, very slight differences going on. And um, then I realise, after he castles, which he didn't necessarily have to do quite then at that point. I mean, he's still got options even of maybe castling queenside as well. He's got quite a lot of density of material around there. If I capture the knight with my knight, um, or either piece really, a queen can't recapture because I loses the queen. So if he's going to not lose material, has to capture with a pawn, and what, what do we see? Again, the king is on a semi-open file. So I move my bishop. Now, maybe a beginner might have thought I'm going to retreat my bishop to safety, but I don't want to um, retreat to safety when I've got a good option of attacking. So this is a forcing move. Putting my bishop here is hitting his rook, and it's forcing my opponent's hand on the next turn. It means he has to do something which may weaken his position. The rook is one of the defenders of f7, for example. Okay, so... Um, Obviously, there's only one likely move. And now, 
you can see the situation. I've got a bishop now lined up against f7. I've got this bishop covering this diagonal. This king is starting to look very exposed indeed. So what do I want to do at this point? I, I can't, I'm very, very unlikely to uh, checkmate black using two bishops. So I need to bring in the big guns. And that means probably my queen. My, my queen can't go to there because of this bishop. So I need to be thinking about how can I maneuver my queen into the game, and possibly even rooks. So my idea is to push h3, move my knight out of the way, right? You see, and this is actually a, a good pattern for you to remember. Sometimes just push the pawn, then because you see this knight from here, it can go h4. It could go to there maybe, um, but but then where? You know, but here I'm thinking goes to h2, then g4, where it's protected by the pawn, and then it's looking at this vulnerable pawn here. Okay, so it's just a quick way to get my knight out of the way. I could have moved my knight straight to here, and maybe to there. That would have also been absolutely fine. Uh, so bishop comes out, and now there's some tension between these two light squared bishops. I'm not concerned about that tension because my goal here is to. Uh, checkmate black. You also notice that with this move, black's attacking this bishop, but this bishop has actually has quite an important job because it's stopping my queen from going to g4. Okay, it's on a lovely long diagonal. It's a good bishop. You shouldn't maybe be thinking about swapping it off at this point. Okay, so now he pushes with a pawn as well. I grab. And now this bishop cannot retreat. It, it, it can't go here or here or here on this diagonal. It, it would have to retreat back to back to here if, if at all. Um, so what black decides to do now is to remove the threat of this dark squared bishop. Okay, so the first thing that I do is grab off his light squared bishop, thereby uh, making g4 now available for my queen to come in with check. I think maybe it would have been advisable instead of playing that move simply to retreat this light square bishop slightly but again you can see that my pieces are now starting to close in on the king anyway. I haven't even castled yet. Um, so bishop comes in, we exchange bishops and he recaptures with the pawn and then queen comes in with check. Okay, so obviously he can't capture my bishop because he's in check. And when you're in check, there's only one thing you, you must do, which is to get out of check. So we have king moves to f7, and now we swap off the bishops. Okay, king captures. I still have a knight that could come in, and I've got ideas maybe castle, and then bring this rook around, stuff like that. Um, there's no bishops left on the board, but you can see very very common situation again here look at this so this 800 to 900 player right his pawns are in a mess i've so often see this when i play low rated people that they um make pawn moves or they're forced to make pawn moves that leave their pawns shattered and fragmented um, my pawns are in a very strong position here right I haven't lost a pawn yet, and they're all pretty much protecting each other. So I'll probably think about castling queenside at some point. Let's see how it progresses. So I move my queen here. There are There's an undefended pawn there. These are actually defended. So I'm threatening to take the pawn. Knight comes in with a threat of knight takes c2 and a fork. So I'm, I don't want to allow that, so I castle. And now a pawn pushes. Okay, this opens up a discovered attack between the two queens. I could initiate the exchange if I wanted to, but why initiate the exchange? Just grab the free pawn. Now the queen comes out with check and also forking g2. So I move the king out of the way and queen grabs g2. Now, I'm not sure that queen capturing g2 was really um, helpful for black. There's a difference between grabbing a free pawn here when I'm on the attack there and grabbing a free pawn here, completely opening up the G file, 
when I've got two rooks here lurking ready to jump in. So the first thing I do is I go in with one check. King moves out the way and now I grab the spare pawn here. This does a few things. I mean, I'm attacking this knight. I'm also attacking this pawn on c7. Now I'm completely expecting black now to capture on f2, defending the knight with the queen. This player is taking his time. He's used half of his time, which is good. Very good to see. Right, he's down on 15 minutes on the clock, so I expected him to find this move, which he does. He's playing you know, pretty well. Uh, I come in and grab the other pawn, and now you can see this king's starting to look very sorry indeed. So the game doesn't go on for that much longer. King moves out of the way. I push a pawn with check. That really removes some of these ki this king's options. So now he can't go anywhere on the uh, seventh rank, and he can't stay where he is, so he has to come somewhere to here on the G file. And what do we know about the G file? Well, black just opened it up. All right, king goes onto the G file. I come onto the G file with my queen. And what we're doing now is we're pushing this king down into my side of the board. This pawn is defended currently by the queen. And now, simple uh, pin. Because the king's being forced onto now the F file, then I actually had a, a move earlier on as well, if I show you this one, um, which is a nice idea. <clears throat> so before I played the, the check with the pawn, I could have actually played knight to g4 with a fork on the king and the queen, and if pawn had taken, I could have simply moved my rook across with a pin on the queen and, and won the queen that way as well. But in the end, this is simple enough. King moves, win the queen, and now that's checkmate. There we go, because this square is covered by the knight. So there you go. Um, I think the whole point of, of what we're saying here is that um, players rated below 1,000 can play chess. There, there's no question about that. And the, the difference between being sub 1,000 and above 1,000 it's, it's not that massive. It comes down to the little things. It comes down to not blundering pieces. It comes down to not trapping your own pieces. It comes down to um, not opening up a file when you, your king is, is going to be more exposed. Right? Small things, small differences. That's all you need to be focusing on. Right? You don't have to be reading 10 moves deep into a chess game. I can't do that. I, I haven't got that kind of level of concentration or, or experience. But so all you need to be doing is just thinking, if this, then what? Does that make my situation better or does it make my opponent's situation better? Does it make mine worse? Really as simple as that. That's going to take you right beyond 1,000 rating points. You're going to enjoy your chess a lot more and spend a lot you know, less of your time scrabbling to try and rescue a lost situation. I think something else that we've seen from this game as well is that just knowing a few openings can make a big difference. So what have we seen here? I've used the Italian, I've used the Grand Prix in reverse, and I've used the London system, right? All very solid, all very useful, very practicable, tried and tested, good openings. Okay, hope you've got a bunch of stuff from this video. See you soon.